Good morning, everybody. Um, thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Ben Thomas. Uh, I'm a senior research associate at the, uh, the University of Bristol's Smart Internet Lab in the, in the United Kingdom. Um, and I'm going to be chatting uh, briefly this morning uh, before our fireside talk with uh, the rest of the, uh, the partners in this project about the uh, 5G tourism um, applications that we've been researching. Um, a bit briefly about uh, what's been going on at the University of Bristol and how we arrived at what we're doing. Um, the, the United Kingdom, uh, the UK uh, Department for Culture, Media and Sport um, has funded a 5G testbed in Bristol, elsewhere in the United Kingdom. And uh, we've constructed a 5G testbed where we're open to uh, collaboration uh, to research what uh, 5G uh, could mean in different, uh, in different domains, in different industries, in different, different fields of interest. So in this case, um, we've been uh, studying with, uh, with our partners about tourism and what it means. So tourism in the west of England, around Bristol, is quite a large part of the economy. We're blessed in the area with some, um, some real prime heritage sites. Uh, namely, in particular, we have the Roman Baths, which is some 2,000-year-old uh, uh, leisure center, you could think of it as, but it's, uh, it's become a little bit more than that with the heritage, uh, the heritage situation there. Um, it's worth billions, the local economy, and the, the real question that, we've been, that, we've been, that was put to us was, what's 5G going to do for, uh, for tourism? What's 5G going to do for heritage? And we, uh, we researched that, and we have, some, uh, we have some answers, essentially. So um, working with uh, CCS, uh, the, the BBC and um, Zeta Networks uh, uh, in Bristol were able to um, uh, take some of the applications that are promised at the, at the, from, from 5G, from 5G KPIs, low latency, enhanced mobile broadband, and uh, Internet of Things, uh, uh, massive machine-to-machine -machine communication, and uh, applied them to the tourism sphere. Now, in, in this case, primarily, we focused on the, uh, on the low latency side of things. And what that means is, um, who, who recently has been to a, uh, been to a museum, actually, might, might ask? So, you? There's a few people. So, uh, do you see those, uh, the tour guide, uh, the audio tour guides you can book and you can... They're a bit clunky, aren't they? It's a bit of a throwback to the, uh, to the 90s. And, and, and one must ask, really, why, we, why do we still use this kind of, uh, this kind of tech when, you know, right, we're right on the cusp of having uh, sort of better immersive augmented reality, virtual reality applications that could run over 5G. And that's something that we, uh, we worked with and that we, uh, we developed. Essentially, it amounted to... Imagine yourself in the Roman baths, looking at the, uh, the heritage site. It's a bit, uh, you know, mind the step. There's a couple of cracks in the concrete. It's a bit of an old looking, uh, it's, a bit of an old, it's a bit of an old beast. But with an application on your handset, uh, Ardman Animations were able to develop uh, a 3D rendering of what the Roman baths looked like previously. Once, when the Roman baths were just a mere hot spring in, the boat, uh, in, the, in, a, in a field in the, in the area, to when the Romans actually constructed it, and then once the Romans left, as the building began to fall into decay. Now, so you move your handset around, using um, uh, onboard and offloaded out in the network, uh, network functions, we're able to track the user through their perspective, and they're able to see, almost like a window through time is the, uh, is the terminology, um, we're able to see what the Roman baths looked like. Oh, you know, this, this, is, this, is a, this is a handset app, and it, it doesn't seem that exciting uh, on, the, on, the, on the front of it. But what is exciting is we're able to use some 5G technologies like multi-access, edge computing, to get that low latency that's needed so that the, uh, the video rendering or the, the 3D space rendering doesn't take place in the handset, it takes place in the network. So it doesn't matter if you have, a, if you have a, a cheap phone, an expensive phone, an iPhone, a Samsung, Android, iOS. Everything is done remotely. Everyone gets the same level of service. And... Uh, and we, and we make use of the, uh, the compute functionalities that are broken up in the center of the, uh, in the 5G network and a bit more close to the edge to get that latency. So, um, yeah, um, really, it's, uh, it, it, the, the whole project was about enhancing the user experience, moving away from these 1990, uh, 1993 audio tour guide uh, situation to something that's a bit more exciting, it's a bit more uh, accessible to, uh, to visitors of uh, heritage sites like Bristol. And uh, it couldn't have been possible without the, uh, the work from uh, well, the University of Bristol, uh, Zeta Networks, who uh, drive their SDN controller, um, Ardman Animation, who uh, were fantastic in rendering the, uh, the 3D space, uh, and of course CCS then, who provided the, um, who provided the, uh, uh, the wireless network connectivity that was possible to, uh, to, to make this happen. Um, in terms of results, um, in, terms of, um, in terms of what, this, uh, what, what we learned, there's a few key things. One, um, the 60 gigahertz mesh network that CCS uh, provided us, it really does work. 
and uh, you might not know, but Bath is quite a pain to um, install infrastructure in. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. You can't just go drilling dishes anywhere. But the, the ability of the CCS uh, mesh network running at 60 gigahertz was able to um, uh, rapidly deploy our network to where we did have permission, not to where would have been most convenient for line of sight. So um, that was a real good uh, planning boom for us. The second main thing that we took away was that MEC does work and that uh, we're able to lower the latency such that such an application um, is exciting and it is possible. So um, I think um, uh, that's pretty much what I've got to say for an introduction. Um, uh, I'd like to introduce onto the stage uh, the partners in this project who are uh, from uh, CCS and Zeta Networks. And um, um, we'll be uh, taking questions on this uh, fireside talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. You can actually take a seat. That one. Oh, yeah, I'm going to get another Smashing, one. Smashing. The clicker, yeah, the but right. I had no slides. So. Sound on? Hi everybody, thanks Ben. Um, yeah, thanks for the introduction to the project. So, as Ben said, CCS, Cambridge Communication Systems, uh, over the years we've developed a, a self-organizing mesh uh, millimeter wave technology that essentially provides gigabit uh, backhaul connectivity, um, so extending a fiber um, through a, a city environment uh, to, to locations in the area where basically it's very difficult to get fiber um, or, or very expensive to deploy fibre as well. So, as, as Ben gave the example in the Roman Hello. Baths and around uh, Bath, yeah. which is a very historic area, um, it's extremely difficult to deploy uh, new fixed uh, fibre services in those areas. Um, we used our new 60 gigahertz millimetre wave uh, mesh technology to extend the fibre and effectively provide a very high capacity, low latency connection into the baths that then connected in the uh, the, the cloud and the core network through to the, um, through to the access network. Uh, so that was our role in the project. Um, and we also provided a uh, 26 and 28 gigahertz mesh in the Bristol area for the Millennium Square project. And, and our, our role there was to provide, again, connectivity um, and the uh, application and use case there was public safety. So, so Justin will talk a bit about the public safety and the net, network slicing that was running over that, uh, over that system. Okay. Thanks. Hi, so uh, I'm Justin Paul from Zeta Networks and we were one of the partners in the, in the Catalyst. Um, what we do, we're a software company, a startup in Bristol, is we do a lot of work around software-defined networking, how you build, manage and slice networks, uh, particularly in the 5G space. Um, as we know, tourism is very uh, important to economies, but it's also uh, very important that you as a city, you as a venue, are able to protect and keep your tourists safe. So one of the aspects we really focused on was how you would manage public safety networks um, a a alongside uh, major tourist uh, attractions. And I think we all know when you get a lot of people together in one place today, the networks tend to suck a little bit. And that creates all sorts of problems if there's an incident, if there's a requirement to do something different. So we looked at how you can slice the network. And that's what we did in this case. We sliced the network. We created a tourism slice, a sort of general public slice. But also that could be something that could be offered as part of the, um, the venue's experience um, so that people don't, aren't, don't build up big data fees. Um, but we wanted to be able to deliver a public safety capability. And most of the time, public safety users don't require a lot of bandwidth, but sometimes they do things that do. And we did some work around thermal imaging cameras. There are all sorts of image processing apps around people leaving baggage, identifying people in a crowd that are quite bandwidth intensive. And what we showed was the ability to flip up uh, a, a public safety slice that took priority over everything else, run that slice, and then tear it down at the end of the event. So you could guarantee and protect the public safety capabilities in around all the work that was going on around the, the smart tourism, that very dense, high bandwidth requirement. And that's really what we've been doing, and it's been a lot of fun. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so thank you. Is my mic working? Yeah, it is? Okay. Sorry. Um, so we had a really good, okay, now it's definitely working. 
uh, overview of the project. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about why you needed 5G specifically to deliver uh, this application? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, uh, it's a really good question because when you look at a lot of the trials, because they're not done at scale, people say, well, couldn't I do this with Wi-Fi? Couldn't I do with this, this, with this, this with 4G? And there are one or two things that you can only really do with a proper 5G network. Um, the first is virtual reality, augmented reality. If any of you have had a go at some of those games, if they're slightly out of sync, if they're delayed, you get quite nauseous. It's quite a, an unpleasant experience. You need very, very low latency in the networks to uh, overcome that. So that's the first thing that 5G delivers. Um, we talked about mobile edge computing. The ability to process things off, off, um, off the phone is hugely important. Anyone who's been out and about for a day will realize your battery life gets hammered. And, and if you're using mobile edge computing to do all that heavy lifting on the device, um, it actually preserves your battery life, which is actually really important to the tourist experience. And I think the, the final thing is that ability to deal with very dense networks, lots and lots of people at an event or a, a, a cultural event, all using their phones, all activating social media, hammers the network in a way that only 5G networks can really support. I think you hit the nail on the head there. I mean, the, the, the low latency, high capacity required for, for the applications that we talked about is, is key. Um, and, and part of that is the access network, which connects in the handsets. Part of it is the, the transport network, the backhaul mm -hmm. network as well. Um, obviously, the goal, the, the ultimate goal would bring to be to bring fiber to every site, but you can't do that. So, so you need uh, other technologies like, like millimeter wave uh, transport solutions. Um, clearly, they have to be much higher capacity than uh, uh, micro transport solutions have been in the past um, and, and maintain low latency as well. So delivering, um, for example, sub one millisecond latency end to end over a transport network is, is a requirement. Um, being able to deliver one gigabit, 10 gigabits over these uh, millimeter wave uh, networks is, is also a requirement as well. So you need both the capacity and the latency. So my next question is actually going to be about the, the millimeter waves in what you talked about, Justin, the uh, public safety network. So can you tell us a little bit more about that? We heard about obviously the latency, but you know, <coughs> tell us a little bit more about the, the specific role of the millimeter waves in uh, public safety networks, please. Okay, yeah. Well, the, I mean, the higher frequency um, that, that we run in our mesh um, gives us access to much more spectrum than you would have at lower frequency. Um, you know, lower frequency unlicensed technology is, is been used very widely for, for, for Wi-Fi applications. Um, you know, the noise floor has been rising and rising over the, over the years. Probably in an area like this, you get pretty patchy Wi-Fi and, and it would be quite, uh, um, you know, the performance won't be uh, good enough to be able to stream uh, content or run low latency applications. So. I think getting, getting to millimeter wave gives you access to you know, much more spectrum um, and it allows you to run much lower um, latency services as well. So, so you can guarantee quality of service basically over that network end to end, um, which is something you probably couldn't do before in the lower frequencies. I mean, I think to that, one of the things we did in the public safety piece was a deployable instant area network. Effectively, we had a van with a thermal imaging camera and a CCS millimeter wave node. And you were actually able to drive that to site, deploy it within minutes, and effectively run, run the node up a pole, and then you'd be streaming live thermal imaging imagery, roughly about 40 megabits per second. So not huge, but not insignificant, back to the control room to help support emergency services. And it really was a very resilient and useful technology for that public safety uh, demonstration. So BBC R&D, who are one of your champions on this project, um, decided to go for a private cloud um, to host their augmented reality app. So can you tell us a little bit more about why they chose a private cloud as opposed to a public cloud? Okay, so um, this question uh, really addresses the, uh, the move that the industry is going to be taking 
uh, uh, where you raise the question, well, lots of, lots of apps at the moment, they make use of the, uh, the public cloud. They, they're quite happy on AWS, on EC2 instances, and that sort of thing. So why would they, why would they make use of uh, a private cloud that an operator might, uh, operator might make available? Well, in this case, there's two, there's two main things that, uh, that we're really pressing on this. One is the, uh, the nature of the app is, uh, is an augmented reality app. It uh, requires very, very low latency. You have to take uh, a feedback loop from the handset, send it out to the uh, compute resource that's, that's, that's apart from the, uh, the handset, and the data gets fed backwards to the, uh, to the device um, so that uh, the, the, the latency of the application is, uh, is very low. In our test, we were getting two, three, four milliseconds of latency, which was um, delivering a lovely uh, user experience. And that can't be delivered from a public cloud like, uh, like AWS or, uh, or uh, Google, uh, Google, Google Cloud Compute. The, uh, the, the compute resource in that case, it could be in Amsterdam, it could be in North America, it's, it's, it's a very far way away and the, the only way they're going to really address that problem is to bring the compute closer to the user and in this case the best person to do that would be the operator who wherever their E node B's or their G node B's in the, in the 5G world are going to be, that's where the compute can be, that's where the latency can be cut down. The other main reason, um, the other main reason that they were quite keen to use a, a private, uh, private hosting solution uh, was based on the hardware requirements of the application. So uh, for those of you who are familiar with uh, uh, booking things on uh, public cloud, you can book your CPU, your RAM, uh, storage uh, capability, and that sort of thing. What you can't really do is drill down to specifically the kind of hardware you want. So if you want, uh, say, for example, um, GPU compute resource, uh, it, you, wh which one you get is going to be down to whatever the market really wants the most of. Do you want it for AI processing or do you want it for uh, rendering graphical, uh, graphical images? And, and it's, a, it's a difference that uh, being the user, when you do it, do it yourself, you do it right, but if you rely on the public cloud, you're, uh, you're going to struggle to get precisely what you want uh, to precisely eke out the performance that you want from the application. So yeah, private cloud in this case um, was something that, uh, something that really worked for the project. Is this working? No, okay, it's working now. Sorry. Uh, speaking about this application, how else do you think the, the a similar business model might be used? What's the, the scope of the opportunity uh, for future applications? Well, the, the business, uh, the business capability, the business uh, sort of uh, reach of this is quite interesting. And um, if you look at the uh, the revenue of uh, network operators today. Um, there are, we've, we've saturated it. There, there, uh, as many people there are, there are subscribers, and the amount the subscribers are paying is actually going down. Um, so from a business point of view, such an application as this, where uh, your museum is, uh, it has an application that requires hosting local to the user, that's a perfect business opportunity for the, um, for the network operators to get in and to create their own cloud infrastructure um, where the museum or the, or the application developer will be able to host their resource there and um, uh, create a new revenue stream for the, uh, for the network operator diversifying their business model a little bit, moving away from subscribers, moving more towards um, hosting for uh, specific applications. If I, if I could be a little bit more radical around that, I mean, I think one of the things we've seen, there hasn't been a lot of innovation in, in the business models in the industry. Effectively, you've got business to consumer, and you've got an adaptation of business to consumer, which is done as business to business, which is the discounts and everything else. And the industry does need to innovate much more in terms of the business models going forward. One thing I think you'll see with 5G is there aren't many things you can do with 5G in the consumer space, you know, how fast you want to watch Netflix. It's about industrial and business to business applications and that requires new business models. And I mentioned before, who pays for that application when you go to a museum and you watch something Potentially, you're, you're transmitting a lot of data, but in most cases, it's not going very far. It might not even be leaving 100-meter perimeter of where you are. You need a business model that reflects that, and perhaps the, uh, the exhibition, uh, the, the venue itself, will be paying for that, um, the, the transport of that data um, in what you call the sort of Amazon Kindle model. You know, if, you, if you take the app to look at the artificial reality, the cost of buying that covers the cost of the data, et cetera. And I think we need to see much more innovation in and around the industry around that if, if the technology is to be a big success. So a two-part question, really. Um, are you planning on pursuing this project any further? And if you haven't really thought about that, what might you possibly be able to explore further 
along the same lines? So, um, from the university's perspective, uh, we're very keen to, uh, to continue researching this. And in particular, the area that we're really focused on uh, at the moment is, I've talked about uh, placing the compute function of an application closer to the user, bringing it into the Mac, bring it into the 5G network. Um, but they, we can go a step further than that. And we're really keen to um, analyze the network, analyze where the traffic is flowing, analyze and understand where compute resources might be free, and then using uh, machine learning and AI to uh, support uh, application developers and application uh, users in, in hosting their application in the best place in the network. So it's not, it's not always intuitively, uh, it's not always true what might be intuitive. You think that it would be straightforward just to put an application directly where the user is, but you know, it might not necessarily be so. There, there are some things that might be hidden in, the, uh, hidden in the details that an AI or machine learning would pick up and host, break the application up into, into two or three parts and host them in other places where it might be cheaper, where the balance might be right between cost and performance um, and all the other metrics that go with it. So we're really keen to take this forward and to study where the, uh, uh, really get a grip and the me measure the network where resources are available, and then see how that would affect the application's placement in the network, where in the edge you actually want to place the, uh, your virtual network function. I think for, for CCS, um, we're, we're pretty agnostic about the type of application that runs over the, the infrastructure in the backhaul network. Um, we, we had to obviously provide uh, table stake sort of um, KPIs, you know, the, the, the latency, the quas, uh, the capacity requirements for, for the backhaul for the uh, for the access network. But um, clearly, you know, smart city infrastructure is, is due to grow and site identification is required. So you look at a mobile operator today, has 50,000 sites, they may need to densify by 10x um, to provide uh, 5G connectivity. Um, and, and that clearly requires many, many more sites uh, in cities and rural areas as well. So it's about how do you get a connection to those, to those uh, you know, whether they be small cells or macro sites, Wi-Fi access points. Um, neutral host is, is a big theme at the moment, so being able to reduce the TCO of that network by sharing it um, by multiple operators or multiple applications. So a, uh, a local council may um, run a network as a service, but also may backhaul their public Wi-Fi network over it or may backhaul their CCTV security cameras over it as well. Um, and that, that obviously has a big impact in the, uh, in, in the TCO of, of a 5G network. And I think from the Zeta's point of view, I mean, the good news is we were involved in one of the UK government's DCMS 5G trials, the Smart Tourism trial. That's now been extended. And the focus of the extension really is about scalability. So a year ago, there weren't many 5G phones around, you know, and that was a problem to load the networks and do a lot there. That's improving, and we're hoping during the course of the summer to be involved in a number of events where we will start to stress test the networks a little bit more, see whether slicing works in a, in a very congested network as expected, uh, and really prove the technology, take it forward to the next step. Great, thank you very much. Um, we are out of time, but if anybody wants to hear more, see a demo, uh, your booth is downstairs, right? Level two. level two. So level two in the Catalyst area, which is within the Expo area, go and find these guys and get yourselves a demo. Thank you very much to our panelists. Thank you. Thank you.